and these, these are like independent artists. They'd raise like, you know, thousands of dollars. Yeah. That's a colonoscopy. I think it's a colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a chase of check. Gold. Go. Gold. <laughs> When I first went on YouTube and discovered that, that, that you can actually get time lapse of just like a field, I was like, holy shit, this is cool. Someone just puts their camera and, because my brother did that. My brother did a documentary about the Wilder Church mm -hmm. and he put his camera and left it there for a year. Interesting. <laughs> and would come back and change battery, change things, but pretty much was time lapsing for about a year. And so he has, he put it to a six minute music video of the whole fucking thing being built. Great. Yeah, it was cool. All right. Do you, are you surrounded with very talented people that constantly you're impressed with? I am this morning. Because um. <laughs> you're here now, you mean? Or before? Or you, you just came from a workshop? <laughs> no, no, I, I came from home. No, I'm here, I'm here with you. We have a couple things to address today. Chico, are you recording this now? What's going on? We're, yeah. we're always on. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know that. I thought we were waiting for you, Chico. Oh, we got was... another one, Chico. <laughs> we got another one. He's a freshie. 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 Okay. The last time we spoke, yeah. you told me a wonderful, wonderful uh, anecdote. Paraphrasing, you know, you can build, the person who build things, you know, the, those buildings. Or how did it go? Don't tell me. You can yeah. invest in real estate and... Uh, yes. Improve the real estate, the, the home, but yes. one day the improved real estate is still there, but you're gone. And the only thing that's really worth improving, the only thing that you really own, is your soul. What's in your head and in your heart. And that's what you should be investing in to improve yourself. You sh we should all be trying to go on to perfection. This is a foundational principle of probably all religions. It's a foundational principle of uh, ancient Greek Stoic thought, every day reflect on what you did during the day, what you did wrong, and how you can improve tomorrow. Benjamin Franklin did that. It's a foundational element of the Methodist Church, whose principle is you should all try to go on to perfection. There's nothing strange or unusual about it, so we should all be trying to improve ourselves. See, I love this. Mm -hmm. it, I would say it feels like to me I'm not around, I'm not in a community of other people who are practicing this, and almost can look like if you're practicing it, everyone's not. It's like well, but the you, person who's constantly telling people, he's like the self-improvement guy, the person who wants, you know. Well, it helps to be in a community yes. of people, but <laughs> it's you can't control other people. All you can control is what's in mm -hmm. your head and in your soul. Mm -hmm. And so um, you don't know what really other people are doing in their time away from you, but you have yourself and you need to work on yourself I um, mean, we, we identify this with America and self-improvement and exercise shows, but it's just a very ancient principle, and it certainly helps to be with good people, whether it's a ski team or a church or um, some club that's doing something, uh, but it's, it all comes down to you. What does and, it look like for you, like practically, to talk about how, how this is, what, how, how, what, how does this look like for you in, in your life? In my life? Well... I'm 60 years old. I've, I've had lots of uh, changes in my life. And uh, I suppose, like many people, um, didn't think too much about religion or spirituality or philosophy when I was younger. I was too busy making my way in the world. Um, as you get older, you think about, you know, you only have so much time left and you want to be as good a person as you can be. You know, I, I've thought about it, and we're here to talk about my book, Courage 101. And, uh, you know, I wrote the book because I worked for a small company and the owner suddenly retired. And there I was, 57, 58 years old, didn't have a job. I mean, she just shut down the company and with a month's notice. And so I had to go into a job search. And one of the things I did to occupy myself was to write this book. Courage 101 has 101 chapters, 101 true stories from history, courageous things people did. And my goal was to write it in 101 days. And I didn't quite make that goal of 101, but I probably wrote it in about 115 days. A lot of people think wow. that happiness depends on winning the gold medal or winning the World Series. And what happens is they win the Super Bowl or they win the big prize and they're standing there with the silver cup or the Oscar and they feel sad, they feel empty, they feel disappointed because 
it's not the goal, it's the process. It's the process that makes you happy. But too, too many people don't think about, they think only about the goal. It's, it's the daily process of doing whatever it is you do, whether it's weightlifting or writing or, or being a lawyer or a doctor. Um, it's the process that's important. Mm -hmm. It's the trying every day that's important. When you say, if someone says, what do you mean improve yourself? Mm -hmm. What does that mean, if to, to improve yourself? Well, it, it, it could be any number of things. It could be physically to exercise. It could be morally, spiritually. It could be your diet. It's going to be different things for different people. And, uh, you know, I'm, everybody's got their strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'd like to lose a few pounds. My mm -hmm. weight goes up and down. And in recent weeks, I've been eating too much. And I, I don't like that. Mm. I just don't because mm. it's... To have a bowl of ice cream after dinner most days of the week is not necessary. I'm just doing it. <laughs> I've been doing that same thing. You know, <laughs> well, but it's okay, but it's okay. If it, doesn't, if it doesn't bother you, it's okay, well, but it bothers me. Well, okay, so that, so, so here's a distinction, distinction, because a lot of people get, I think, lost in, in a material thing. The mm -hmm. problem is the ice cream. The problem is mm -hmm. the drug. Yeah. The problem is if you eat ice cream and feel guilty about it, that's a problem. I, I, yeah, I think that's... Yeah, because I've ate ice cream, because I was a health nut, for, yeah, and right. then, then I've been experimenting with different... Yeah, just, and then, like, yeah. I was like, oh, I'm going to... Someone who never drinks alcohol ever, and mm -hmm. I haven't been drunk in my entire mm -hmm. life, I'm going to have a giant bowl of ice cream yeah. and a beer, uh -huh. just like every night. And I've done that for, like, the past <laughs> week. Ice cream and beer together. <laughs> ice oh, cream and beer. Yeah. Just... To like to like not be so because I've been always so hard and I've, it's okay. So now I'm like doing that. I'm like, but then I'm always like, I don't know if I want to be eating a bowl well, of ice cream, giant well, bowl then, of ice. Then work on stopping. You know, <laughs> you know, okay, but how 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 do you how well, do you you know habits are very interesting. You know, we all have good habits and bad habits, yeah. and when we think about breaking a bad habit or starting a good habit. It's there's some little tricks involved. For example, let's say you don't exercise, and what people typically do, they they dive into it. They get into some rigorous program, and they really feel like they've got to bust a gut. And what happens is they get hurt, they feel bad, they're sore. They're, you know, just it's awful, and they go, "I hate exercise." That's not how you do it. First thing you do is you start slowly. The second thing is you create rituals that make exercise fun. Maybe you buy special clothes. Maybe you buy yeah, a cool yeah. pair of sneakers, a red pair, pair of red sneakers, yeah, or yellow yeah, sneakers. Yeah, yeah. And so you only wear them to exercise. And so you feel like yeah. you're Superman when you put these sneakers on. So it's a special ritual to get yeah. started. And, but then when you're done with the exercise, give yourself a treat. Have a piece of chocolate. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just like training a dog. Gold, yeah, give yourself a piece right. of chocolate. Then after a few weeks or a month, you won't want the piece of chocolate, but you'll have this, this habit set up. The same thing, let's say you smoke cigarettes. So you replace the cigarette habit with a habit that's bad but less bad. Let's say you, you start to say, I'm going to stop smoking, but I'm going to eat, drink 12 cups of coffee, or I'm going to eat a lot of chocolate. You shouldn't eat two pounds of chocolate a day, but it's better than smoking cigarettes. So you replace the cigarettes with two pounds of chocolate, and then you wean yourself off the chocolate to go to something less harmful. Awesome. You know, it's not about torturing yourself. You have to. It's about engineering. It's, it's about just being bi aware of your biology and how to engineer things. Yeah, right. And we're creatures things. of these. Yeah, yeah, we need these. Yeah. These and to habits. be happy about what you're doing, and not don't feel like you have to suffer and be a martyr. You know? I think we're a product of the mind. Exactly. What do you think? Here in America, and, we, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. Undoing the uh, uh, the chaos in the mind, the insanity of the mind, mm -hmm. that is uh, like in fear. So the only thing worth doing is just like sort of you could say expanding love. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you were saying? Well, you know, here in America, we we believe that we should pursue happiness. That somehow this yeah, is American goal this. is pursuing happiness, sure. but. That, that's, that's not right. What you need to do is pursue meaning, because when you pursue meaning, so right. that creates happiness. Um, yes. Back during World War II, one of the stories in the book is about an Austrian psychotherapist, um, whose name unfortunately escapes me at the moment, um, and he was Jewish, and he and his entire family were sent to the death camps. And he was... Wow. Even though they lived under Nazi occupation for a year or two, he was naive, and he told his wife, he said, I want you to sew the manuscript of my new book into the lining of my winter coat because I'm going to work on it wherever they're sent. He didn't know where they were being sent. We're going to work on it there. Well, of course, they get there, and 
everything is taken from him. His coat taken, thrown into a fire, all his clothes taken, his hair shaved off. He's left with nothing but his body. And it was very interesting because some people lived and some people died. I mean, obviously, many people had no choice, but some people gave up. And when they gave up, they would die quickly. And many of these people, they would say things like, well, we're going to be liberated by the holidays. We're going to be liberated by spring. We'll be freed. And then spring would come and go, and they would lose hope. And then in a few days, they'd just wither up and die. And this really puzzled him. And what he concluded was that everything can be taken from you. You can be stripped of everything in your life, but the one thing that no one can take from you is what's in here. No one can take away your free will. It's in here. You can decide whether you want to live or die. It's up to you, and that can't be taken from you. Let's say you don't have an eggplant, and you're in a terrible situation, and lo and behold, when it's over, you can go get that eggplant. So you're lost in the jungle. You're in a life raft. And you can say to yourself, my goal is to get to that eggplant. I'm going to yeah. strive for that. That's the meaning in my life at this very moment. Yeah. Is to attain the eggplant. Yeah. You keep that in mind. Yeah. You're freaking awesome. Wow. You know? It's so hard to, everyone's so afraid of ever being seen, is like arrogant. No one can just be honest. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a pretty smart guy and I read a ton of shit and I go, so I go through this book and I go, ooh, fuck. This guy's smart. This is impressive. I go, wow. Cool. You research and you write like just very extremely well. Well, thank you. And I nice say that. And so you research all these people, and then you you put freaking two pages on them, sometimes four, and, and just bang bang like mm -hmm. in two pages. Mm -hmm. There's people learning about all. It's incredible. This mm -hmm. book is in, in is incredible well, book. Thank you. Well, thank it's, you. And I have just started, I almost crashed. I read, reading it uh -huh. on my entire 15 minute drive here you, on the highway. You were reading it <laughs> yeah. while you were driving? Yeah, I, wrote the, the, I, I read the entire Walt Disney one okay. on the way here. Now, Walt Disney, here's a man who had a terrible childhood. His father's, <laughs> his father's occupation was delivering newspapers. Back in the day, everybody subscribed to a newspaper, and when you woke up in the morning, you expected the paper to be there. And so every morning, Walt and his dad got up at like 4 a.m. They had to get the newspapers, fold them up, and go around and deliver them. So he was working two or three hours a day <laughs> before he went to school. Then in the afternoon, he had to deliver newspapers. Walt Disney never played as a child. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he really never did. Yeah. And so when he grew up, his goal was to make children happy. Yeah. Um, so he, tr he transformed his misery into happiness. Most people go through things like this. It could be illness. It could be an accident. It could be unemployment. It could mm -hmm. be divorce. And it's up to you to decide whether you take away a positive thing from it or a negative. Some people have something bad happen and they become bitter. They, they don't take responsibility for their mm -hmm. own uh, role. Or maybe if, even if they're blameless, they, they blame somebody else and they become bitter. And that's the worst thing you can do, to have a grudge. I was 18, mm -hmm. youngest of six kids, mm -hmm. sitting around my house, mm -hmm. uh, dining room table. I had known something was weird going on with my parents because mm -hmm. I visited and like they weren't sleeping in the same mm -hmm. room. Mm -hmm. And so there's eight people around a, a dinner table mm -hmm. And my mom says, we have to tell you guys something. Mm. My sister immediately starts crying because mm. she thought, oh, they're, my, someone's dying. Mm. Dad has cancer. He's dying. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it takes like a little bit until she realizes, oh, no one's dying it was my mom saying like, uh, or we're getting, we're going to separate and dad is going to live somewhere like in this condo, right? This conversation was the most, so that's what was said. It was like, oh, dad's going to live in this uh, mm -hmm. one bedroom condo mm -hmm. we own in mm -hmm. Lebanon mm -hmm. because like we're not really mm -hmm. getting along, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear this. So this is like 15 years ago, mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. but that that was like a traumatic event for the whole family. I mean, people mm -hmm. were like, "This is a huge thing." No one was the fuck because we we people, we never we weren't a family that talked about our emotions mm -hmm. or feelings mm -hmm. or like. But I'm saying, like uh, now looking back at it, 15 mm -hmm. years plus later, 
my whole family went through such tremendous, like it destroyed the whole, in a way it like, you know, it, it like broke up the entire family and nothing's ever been, never, things have never been the same since. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it needed to, I don't think it needed to do that. Mm -hmm. I think we, we, we received negatives and then people formed a lot of negative mm -hmm. thoughts and there was a lot of negatives for the first time mm -hmm. in my family. People that, a lot of anger, mm -hmm. a lot of negatives. And this went on for months and then years mm -hmm. and then it became normal. Yeah. You don't know this because when you meet people, you're in a good, you're, you like them mm -hmm. and then they like you. Mm -hmm. There's no, you, it's not like you meet your wife and then you go, hey, let's role play that we hate each other for two weeks. You can't do mm -hmm. that. I guess first off, there's, uh, Every family has its issues. We, we grew up watching these sitcoms with these perfect families, and every <laughs> yeah. family has its issues. Um, yeah. And But our responsibility is to, to learn from the bad things that happen and to use those experiences to make ourselves a better person. How do you uh, describe what you are when you meet, go out and someone says, oh, hey, George, what do you, wh who, what do you do? How do you, what's your, do you have a, do you have a, Plan oh. thing for what, how you answer that question because you're like a you're a you know I, I a multi-dimensional being. So I say I'm Ryan. I'm a multi-dimensional <laughs> being. <laughs> so you're like, <laughs> and people go, okay, we'll okay. see you later. Yeah, no, what do you say? You say I'm a writer and a painter. You say, or you have some other job that you make you do for money. How do you how do you how do you have such nice clothes and take care of yourself? You're <laughs> you're a natural display. I'm well, 35. How old are you? I'm 60. You're 65, I'm, and you... I'm 60. Let's be clear about that. I'm 60. Oh, you're 60. Yeah, I'm 60. Let's be clear about that. And you, I wished, I would love to look as healthy and vibrant as you. Well, you're just very sweet to say that. When I'm 60. You're very sweet to say that. You look like... That's really nice of you to say that. Well, Do I you mean, feel that way? I feel okay. I mean, this sweater is probably 20 years old, <laughs> and I, I may have taken this to get repaired. I think I did. I mean, why? Why yeah, right would there, I throw nice. this away? Paid ten dollars to get it repaired, so I don't throw away clothes unless they're completely gone. I mean, never, never. So what I have cl clothes that I have my my father's clothes, <laughs> like fifty years old. What, um, do you? So, what's your living situation now? Do any of your kids live in your house? No, my kids are all over the country. Your kids are all over yeah. the place. Yeah. Wow. One in Manhattan, one in San Francisco, one in L.A., and one in Boulder. Manhattan, San Francisco. L.A. Mm -hmm. Boulder, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's so cool. Mm -hmm. I'll play. I have. So you have five siblings. San Diego, mm -hmm. San Francisco, two in England or one mm -hmm. outside wow. England, London and mm -hmm. things, and then uh, Hawaii. Wow, great! Big Island of Hawaii, great. where wow. we should go. Okay, we'll go. Make a plan. I'm gonna go, go in a, a, a probably maybe a week or two weeks. Oh, really? I'm waiting for my wow. mom to get home, and then wow. I'm gonna go. Wow. My brother lives there full time, wow. and they have an incredible community access TV program wow. in Hawaii. It's like the best in the country. They have mm. all this money, so it's like it's. Mm. So I want to make island. a mm. connection between the Big Island of Hawaii and the Upper Valley. I'm mm. gonna be going back and forth mm. over time, and I want to be mm. hel helping people go back and forth as a cultural well, exchange. They have snow there, and we have snow. Mm. And uh, they have, cool, we have yeah. a coast, and they have a coast. I think there are a lot of things we have in common yeah. with Hawaii. Um, we have maple syrup, and they have, uh, I don't know what they have. I'm sure they have a plumeria. Yeah, um, yeah, blossoms. every, every yeah. amazing thing there is, yeah. Cool, George. Yeah. George, you're like a wealth of, um, tell me about your social circle. <laughs> tell me, about, I wonder what, what, what a day looks like for you, like a great day. Are you are you often just alone working, writing, reading, researching, thinking? That's like just your sweet spot. I mean, most recently, I just did three feature articles for a magazine called Virginia. It's the alumni magazine of the University of Virginia, and so the last one I did was the perhaps the most challenging piece I've ever written in my life. It was a profile of Professor Jesse Beams, the late uh, physics professor who was a key player in the Manhattan Project. And uh, so that was, I, you know, it took a lot of work. And it was actually, I was scared going into it because I'm not a science guy. It took courage to do this because I didn't, I didn't know if I could pull it off. But if you break a problem down into little pieces, you can make it happen. You are a badass. <laughs> this is incredible. I love what you do. How fucking exciting is that? Well, Magazine, you get to do these freaking profiles. You get to, you get to learn. 
you have freaking you get to you get to learn fast yeah, and hard yeah. and deep. Yeah. I mean, yeah, who that's, knows? That's what yeah, I like to do that. Yeah. You like, like to know to, shit. I like to learn fast, hard, and deep. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're my new favorite freaking person in the world, man. Man, that's like knowing you is like knowing you, you're you're now like you're like a you're like you're a, what are you? Uh, there's a name for it. God, it's well, something. It's just... Super teacher. You're not just a teacher. <laughs> I, you're not, the most interesting man in the world. The actual most interesting man in the world. Right. You're, come not. on, look at this book. You could go to any cocktail party and but then show it to the camera. Show it to any, the camera. And we'll, they'll cut it in with okay. a nice thing. I want to tell you about a man who's. We really, edit it. I'm not. A, I'm not amazing, nice. but I want to tell you about a man who is amazing. And I wrote a one-man play about his life. Okay, this is a man. That's important. I mean, this is a man. Pardon me. No, this is a different play. Oh. This is a man. Who, imagine if you're 15 years old, okay. you think your father's dead, your father comes back into your life and he says, son, you're leaving the world that you live in now, you're getting a haircut, you're coming with me, we're going to live hundreds of miles away and in a completely different society, speaking a different language, different clothes. Well, how would you react to that if you're 15 years old? Wow, scared as shit, wow. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> this, this man... We know him today as Dr. Charles Alexander Eastman, who graduated from Dartmouth. But he was born in 1858 in a buffalo hide teepee in the middle of a blizzard on an Indian reservation. He was a Sioux, a Santee Sioux, born on an Indian reservation in Minnesota. His mother died shortly after birth. They didn't know what to name him, so they named him, and my, my mind's gone, they gave him a name that means the pitiful one, the last pitiful one, because they expected him to die. No mother, but one of his grandmothers stepped in and raised him. Then when he was four years old, the, there was a big lacrosse match between two clans of the same tribe, and the head of his clan said, if we win today, we're going to give you a new name. And so, sure enough, his clan won, and he got the new name Ohiesa, which means the winner. So he went from being pitiful loser, the last one, the loser, to being the winner. Imagine how that transformed his mind. Now, at the same time, there had been a terrible uprising in Minnesota. Hundreds of settlers killed, hundreds of Indians killed. His father had been arrested. And so far as everyone, they, all the, everyone in his clan had to flee from Minnesota into Manitoba, flee hundreds of miles to escape the American army. And so they thought they knew his father had been arrested, and they figured he'd been executed. The day after Christmas, and I guess 1862 uh, or 3, in the middle of the Civil War, the Army carried out the largest mass execution in American history. And they figured he was hung with, hanged with the other Indians. So anyway, he's 15 years old. He's been raised by his grandmother. One day, and he's been trained to want to hate and kill white Americans. And he'd just been given a rifle. And he later wrote, he said, now I could go among the white men and kill them. This is how he's been raised, to want to go avenge the unjust execution of his father. He's 15 years old, he's been out hunting. One day he walks into camp and he sees this Indian man, a stranger, who's wearing what he called pale face clothes. And his first thought is, I'm going after this guy, I'm going to take him out. And then he learns it's his father. His father's sentence was commuted by President Lincoln. He spent a couple years in prison, converted to Christianity, got 40 acres in South Dakota. He's become a farmer. His father says to him, this way of life we're living, the traditional Indian way is over. It's over. The, everything's done. Our time immemorial, it's ended. You are coming with me to my farm now. And so they walk like 200 miles to the farm. This, this boy is so country, when he sees a train, he's terrified. He thought it was a, a monster. He's terrified. That's how country this boy is. So they get to the farm. His dad, his dad sends him. His dad says, you're getting a haircut. He's got long hair. All the hair is cut off. He says, you're getting a new name. Picks up a book, calls in a preacher, and he says, pick a name out of a book. So his father had taken his, his wife's name. She was a white woman. So he picks two names out of a book, Charles Alexander. He gets baptized at the age of 15. Doesn't speak any English. He's sent to a local school. Then he's sent to an Indian boarding school. Then he's sent to two universities in the Midwest, like prep schools, to train him for college. Then he's sent to uh, uh, Kimball Union, prepare him for Dartmouth. He goes to Dartmouth, big man on campus. Loves Dartmouth. He's a popular guy. Then that's not all. He goes to Boston College Medical School, graduates as a valedictorian. He wants to go back and help his people who are now on the reservation. 
So his, he gets a posting to the uh, reservation in southwestern South Dakota. He goes out there, two months later, wounded knee massacre, a terrible debacle. T dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of Indians killed. These are not people on the warpath. These are families. These are children, babies, women. He's the only, he's only the third Indian doctor in American history, and he's the only Indian doctor there. Indians are brought in by the dozens, wounded, and they won't let the army doctors treat them. So he's got to treat dozens of wounded people. But that's only the beginning of his story. He becomes a lobbyist. He lobbies four American presidents. He writes 10 books. He founds the first national American Indian political society and becomes its president. And he becomes a national lecturer. He spends years traveling around the country. He's very, he's very much like Cary Grant, a very elegant man. And he lectures everywhere from the Harvard Club to the Sheboygan Women's Club, all around the country, talking about the fact that Indians are human beings. Because you imagine this is like 1910, 1920, when people thought all Indians were savages, just drunken savages. So here's this elegant man, like Cary Grant, going out and getting in the, in the faces of white people and saying, look at what's going on in World War I and in Belgium. Look at how savagely the, the Germans are behaving. You call my people savages? I don't know about that. Nobody else was doing this back in that, in that time. So I think he's a remarkable American. Wow. And so I wrote a one-man play about him. <sighs> That's awesome. Uh, he's a forgotten American hero. Recognize well, what's, some, each other what's something that you have overcome? What's an example of something that you have overcome or worked at, specifically worked at to change of yourself? Oh, uh, a long time ago, I smoked cigarettes and that, that ended. Um, but uh, that's because I got run over by a car. That was my method of stopping smoking. I got run over by a car. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great method. It's true. You yeah. got run over recommend. by a car? Yeah. I was sleeping on a beach and this, uh, this man... <laughs> 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 this man, uh, your lead-ins are key, king. God, I get it. So this my team. this man that was yes. creeping along the beach was very crowded, very very crowded. He couldn't see me, and he was creeping along. He was pulling a rowboat or a sailboat behind him on his car, and the beach was so crowded he couldn't see me lying on the sand. And he rolled over the he rolled over my thighs, uh, and I, I as I and so before this happened, I was having this dream, and I had this dream that this tiger, this tiger was looming over me, this hot breath of the tiger, and then the dream changed to an earthquake, and the ground was shaking, and I thought to myself in my sleep, hot breath plus shaking ground means automobile, and I woke up just as his tires rolled over my thighs. Oh, my God. And so I reached up and grabbed his uh, right passenger door handle of his 1980 Chrysler Ares K, and started pounding on his uh, passenger side window, and he turned around and he's like, and he stopped. But anyway, I, I went to the hospital wow. for three days, and so nothing was broken. The sand absorbed the pressure yeah. and the impact, but they kept me in the hospital for two or three days in a room with an older man who was smoking all the time, because this is back when you could smoke in a hospital and yeah. patients could smoke. Yeah. And this disgusted me, and I'd been wanting to stop smoking, and I stopped, par partly because of him. Low points lead to high points. Well, there you go. Could, yeah. Moral. It can. <laughs> yeah, it can. Yeah. It can also lead to lower yeah. points. Yeah, it could, <laughs> if, you're not, if you're not careful, yeah. Uh, George, should we t talk about anything else before is the time I have you? No, you've embarrassed me quite a bit already. So, uh, Well, I think everyone needs to go to the Parish Players the first two weekends in March to see the play 2020 is Hindsight. I'll be one of the performers. There will be eight separate monologues. When is it? When is it? It's the first two weeks of February? The f no, the first, the first two weekends of March at the Parish March. Players Theater in Thetford, Vermont. Yeah, I've been there. They're putting on the play 2020 is hindsight. It's not actually a play. It's a series of eight monologues, people talking about true life experiences. And so come, have fun, enjoy. It's 11 11. Ha <laughs> ha! Bang! That, we're going to end 11 11. Make a wish. Wait, let's all make a wish, Chico. We're going to all make a wish. And if you're watching, make a wish too.